I invite you to open a Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 15 as we are going to be concluding our sermon series looking at the I am statements of Jesus as we've been going through God's word. We've been studying what Jesus says about himself so that we in our faith can know who Jesus is better. And as a result of knowing him better and trusting him more and understanding his grace and mercy for us more, it changes our lives and hearts so that we can go out into the world and bear fruit, that we can go out into the world and share the good news and the love of Jesus with others. And this morning, Jesus makes this statement, I am the vine. And I have heard this text preached on so many times. Now, I'm just going to ask a very dangerous question. How many of you, I know it's never happened with us, but look, let's imagine like another pastor or church, okay? Have come to a worship service, and there was a Bible passage that was about to be preached on, and in your mind, I just want you to be honest with me, we're like, not again. Or I've heard this one so many times, right? Show of hands. Anybody done that? You're just, yeah, okay, right. So one of the things that is difficult sometimes is sometimes we get so familiar with a text that we kind of gloss over it, is what I'm getting at, right? How many of you have heard these I am statements of Jesus? Anybody heard the I am the vine and you are the branches statement? Anybody done a Bible study, right? I can't tell you how many pastors' conferences and leadership retreats I've been to for pastors where this is one of the key focused texts. And after a while, you're just like, okay. (laughs) Now, the danger is that as we become so familiar with certain things that Jesus says, we forget the details, or sometimes we, we forget what he's trying to teach us for our everyday lives. So Jesus says this wonderful statement in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So he's telling us he's the vine and and God the Father is the vine dresser taking care of the garden. And if we keep reading the text, we know that we're the branches, right, connected to the vine, growing the fruit. And so this is a beautiful passage all about Jesus growing us, right? And then get this wonderful word, abide. But the danger is if we just go, oh, okay, well, I've heard this before. I think sometimes we, we forget what Jesus is trying to teach us for our everyday lives. So one of the things that Jesus is trying to teach us is he says it very simply. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, we're in church, and I know you love the Lord, and that's great. And I've talked about this before. There are some times Jesus says something, and our gut reaction is, well, Jesus said it, so it's, it's good, it's right, it's accurate, it's true, right? Anybody agree with me? Okay. And then, even though that's all right, and you're like, yeah, Jesus said it, we don't always like it, right? And our natural instinct as humans and in our American do-it-yourself culture Guess what we don't want to hear from Jesus? That you can do nothing. nothing. We don't like that word. This is the first word in my pastoral ministry. I was way back in Maryland. Someone asked me for the first time ever, what does it say in the Greek? Now, I was young and foolish and just out of seminary. I was like, wow, I've got a church member that wants to really study God's word. And what I learned from that moment is that I was a fool. That wasn't what they were wanting. They were wanting is a way to wiggle out of it. I've learned this about church people. (laughs) You only ask me, what's the Greek or what's the Hebrew say when you're trying to wiggle out of it because you don't like what it says in English? Right? Jesus says, you can do nothing. And we go, okay, I mean, sure, yeah, nothing, okay. But do we actually really believe the nothing part, right? Because I I don't think we normally do. 
How many of you ever want to feel helpless? Anybody ever want to be a, at a point in your life where you're like, I can't really do anything right now. I can't get any goals done. I can't, right? No, none of us would like that feeling, right? It would, for some of us, it would be like the worst feeling in the world being like, I can't make a difference. I can't do anything. I can't help, right? And the way I see this play out with Christians, and it's, it's both good and bad, is we have generous hearts. We have lots of servants in this congregation. We're ready to help others, right? And we're joyful about it a lot of times, which is great. But how many of you want to be on the receiving end of needing help because you couldn't do it? Yeah, that's not as exciting, right? We're like, no, I want to be the helper, right? I want to be the doer. I want to be the servant. I don't want to be the one who can't do anything. And so Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. In my experience, both for myself and then just observing as a pastor, is we really want to negotiate with Jesus on, on that word. What's the percentage? Right? Because surely he doesn't mean nothing, right? Like, how many of you think you can do stuff, right? You're an independent person, right? Show of hands. Like, I get stuff done. I can do it on my own, right? And then Jesus comes along, hey, just so you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. I bet I could do half of it. Right? Any, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I'm going to start negotiating with Jesus on, on what the percentage of, of the work here is. Because I'm a good person. I love the Lord. I'm going to serve. I'm going to do good things. I'm not doing nothing, Lord. I'm not, here's a, here's a word that scares people. I'm not lazy. Right? I don't want to be accused of being lazy for Jesus. And so one of the most important things that Jesus is teaching you and me in this passage is how we actually live the Christian life. Now, I grew up Lutheran, and I heard all my life something that I believe is absolutely true and in the Bible, that you and I are saved 100% by the grace of Jesus. Anybody agree with me on that? We are saved 100% by the grace of Jesus, all of his work, none of my work. And so I did nothing. Now, here's the tricky part. Real Lutheran, we're real comfortable with the nothing on that end of the equation, right? Right? Because that's the whole point of salvation, right? Jesus says, you could do nothing apart from me. We go, absolutely, Lord, it's all your grace. Right? I am saved by grace through faith in you and your death and resurrection. It's all you, none of it me. And that's absolutely true. Here's our problem. Is that as soon as we're like, okay, now that I believe in Jesus, I've been saved by doing nothing. We're okay with the nothing part there. As soon as I'm done with that and I want to get into living the Christian life, living in the real world, all the practical aspects of faith, guess what? I don't want to be accused of doing nothing. I want to say I'm pulling my weight, right? I'm participating. I'm helping with Jesus, right? Here's what we are doing when we act like that. We're acting like toddlers. I love little kids. I worked at a daycare for four years. It was super awesome. I'm talking about the unfun side of toddlerhood, okay? Anybody ever had to work with little kids, your grandparent, your parent, and your babysitting, whatever it might be, and you want to do something for them because you know, as the person in charge, you can do it better and quicker and faster? Anybody ever heard a toddler yell, I can do it myself? And that was like the end of your sanity, usually. You're like, okay, go ahead, knock yourself out. All right. How often do we act like little toddlers, throwing a tantrum with Jesus, when we're trying to live the Christian life? Right? I want to I be more like Jesus. I want to pray more, study God's word more. I, mean, I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life to be more kind and gentle and patient more loving. And Jesus says, oh, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And we go, I can do it myself. Now here's our problem. When we do that, we're saying, I'm going to live the Christian life without Jesus. That's what we're saying. Now you're like, hey, I would never say without Jesus. I mean, yes, yeah, so you would in the way that we live our lives out. When we're telling Jesus, I can do it myself. I can handle this myself. What we're telling him is, I can live this life that you've given to me without you. Because I've got this. I'm in charge here. So one of the most important lessons Jesus is trying to teach you about your Christian life in this passage, when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, apart from me, you can do nothing. He wants you to believe that, not just when we're celebrating that we're saved by grace and 100% his work. He wants you and I to believe that every day of our lives, that I can only live this life he's given to me. I can only grow in the Holy Spirit. I can only mature my faith by being connected to Jesus and trusting in him. That I, I, You and I, in our Christian lives, are always going to need Jesus. It sounds real simple. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? How many of you would agree with me? Like, yeah, I think I need Jesus every day. Cool. Great. We're all in agreement. <laughs> That's not the issue. I think the issue is often when we actually get into the nitty-gritty of life and the pressures and the struggles of life, and we go, I can do it myself because I don't want to be the one that says I need help. I need strength, I need comfort, I need grace. I, I'm, I've got this. So the question becomes, how do we stay connected to Jesus then? Because that's what he's teaching us. He said, there, you're not going to produce any fruit of the Spirit. You're not going to produce life-changing fruit and good works in the world without him. All right? So if you want to know what is the percentage on the you can do nothing part? It's 100%. Jesus is not negotiating with you. He's not giving you wiggle room and saying, well, you know, on Fridays, you can take Fridays. No, he's saying, it's nothing without me. So how do we stay connected to him? So in verse 3, he's going to teach us, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And so when he's saying you're clean, he's saying you've been forgiven, you've been washed clean by his word. So the same that was true for the disciples then is true for you and me, that the first step in order to be connected to Jesus is that we trust in his word that he has washed us clean and made us whole and new, that we are forgiven. And if you want to say it as a Lutheran, you can say we are saved by grace. He's saying that's the first step of how you'd be connected to me is that you trust that I have made you clean by my words. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So just in case you thought he was just making a suggestion by saying apart from me you can do nothing, this is the second time in this passage that he says you can do nothing. He just says it in a fancier way, right? He says, apart from me, right, neither can you unless you abide in me. You can't produce fruit, right? This is like simple agriculture, right? How many of you have ever tried to grow something? Guess what happens if you cut one of the branches off and just set it next to the plant? It dies, like, I mean, that's usually what I'm good at, just killing stuff. But some of you can actually grow things, right? And so Jesus is using like the simplest picture in the world, right? He's not trying to confuse. He's saying, this is what your faith and your Christian life with me looks like. If you are connected to me and rooted in me, you will produce fruit and I will grow you. But if you're not, you'll be like a branch that has been cut off from the plant, from the roots, and you're just sitting by it. And guess what's going to happen to that branch? It's going to wither and die and produce nothing. So this is the second time Jesus is trying to convince you and me that we cannot, without him, live the Christian life 
grow in Christ and grow in our faith and produce good works and fruit. And the way he says it is he says this wonderful word, abide. He says, here's the secret. Because I get asked a lot as a pastor about the practical things of life. Give me the practical aspects of my Christian life. Well, Jesus is saying, here's the practical aspect. If you want the secret to growing in your faith, Jesus and me are about to give it to you, okay? I should write a book. It would be very short. Here's the secret. You abide in Jesus. So write that down. You're like, how do I grow in my faith? Jesus is telling you here, right in verse 4, right? He's not keeping it a secret. He's like, you want to be a branch that grows and produces more fruit? How many of you have that goal? You're like, I would like to produce more fruit and more glory for Jesus. I want more people to know his love. All right? That's your goal. Jesus is saying, here's how you do it. Abide in me and I in you. Now, here's the secret part of the word abide. It literally means to make your dwelling or to make your house, make your home. So Jesus is saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build your home. I want you to build your whole life in me and nothing else. To not root ourselves in other soil, not connect ourselves to other plants, but to build our whole lives, to build our homes in him. And then he says, you're going to produce more fruit. Right? It's, a, it's this wonderful promise that he's making. Right? Sometimes I see ourselves beating ourselves up so much of, I've got to do more. Anybody ever felt that pressure? Or you like internally said, I've got to do more for Jesus. Show of hands. Let's all confess our sins today. I've got to do more for Jesus. What Jesus is saying is, if you abide in me, you what? Will bear fruit. It's, like a, it's a promise. It's a guarantee. He's not saying like, hey, if you abide in me, you might. If you abide in me and then you try really hard to grow, you'll grow. Jesus says, here is how it works. If you abide in me, if you build your life, if you root your whole life in me, you're going to produce fruit. Because that's what a plant does, right? That's what he's saying. If the branches that are connected to the plant, what do they do? Produce fruit. I learned that this year. I actually grew something. Mostly it was my wife, but it was my idea, so I'm going to take credit. All right? We had jalapeno and banana pepper plants because I like spicy food, and she doesn't. And then I realized I bought way too many of these things because we were getting like 40 peppers every other day. It was just like, I can only make so much salsa, okay? <laughs> Started giving it away to people and everything. Now, here's the deal. What was the secret of that? It was just, they were rooted. Why, why did the branches keep producing more peppers? Because they were rooted in a healthy plant, right? It wasn't because they are like, today's the day I'm going to try to grow. It's just the natural outpouring of being in a healthy, rooted situation. And Jesus is saying the same thing for you and I in our Christian life. I want to produce more fruit. I want to do more good things for the Lord. Jesus says, okay, abide in me. Build your life in me. Root yourself in me. And the natural outflow and the natural outcome will be that you and I produce more fruit. And that's a wonderful promise should take a whole lot of pressure off of us saying, oh, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, right? That's falling back into the old attitude of, I can do it myself. I, I can do this on my own. Instead, Jesus is inviting you and me to say, I'm going to abide in him, and I'm going to let him be the one that grows me and matures me and produces fruit in my life. So that's the secret. If you ever wondered, like, how do, how do people become more mature in their faith? How do I grow in my faith? How do I become a better Christian? Jesus is telling you the answer. You just keep abiding in him. Keep staying rooted in him. Because he's going to grow you. He's going to mature you. He's going to produce more fruit in your life. And this is what he says in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So again, what does Jesus say in verse 5? Yeah, okay, we got the nothing part. So stop trying to like, I'm going to do it on my own. That's foolishness. You're not going to thrive and grow in your faith by trying to do it on your own. But I want you to see the promise that is verse 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that what? Bears much fruit. Not, uh, well, they've got a chance at it. Right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, maybe on a good day. What does Jesus say? He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, what is going to happen? You're going to bear much fruit. So again, the secret, the practical aspect of the Christian life of how do I grow in my faith? How do I trust Jesus more? How do I do more good in the world to bring him glory? The secret is abiding in Jesus. He's saying, I'm guaranteeing you fruit in your life. He said, you're going to grow. Because I'm the vine. I'm the root system. I'm the one that's giving you everything that you need, right? That's how it works. If you know plants, he said, I'm the vine. So you, if you are connected to me, I'm going to give you everything you need for the Christian life. So here's one last verse, especially if you grew up Lutheran, to help us understand what this looks like. So Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So if you're a really good Lutheran, you've already got these memorized. I'm not trying to shame the rest of you, but it's okay. I heard these all the time growing up. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So that's the part, right? Earlier we're all like, that's the nothing part that I love. I can do nothing. It's all God's grace, right? Verse 9, not a result of works, not a result of I can do it myself. The yelling at God saying, I got this, right? It's all his work. I do nothing so that no one may boast. It's a wonderful promise, isn't it? I know some of you have heard that a million times, but I think it's good to hear it a million and one. Oh, I'm saved by doing nothing. It's all God's grace and love working in my life through Jesus Christ. Now here's the deal, y'all. I'm gonna surprise some of you. The book of Ephesians actually has more verses Verses 8 and 9 are not the end of Ephesians chapter 2. There's more to it. How many of you are shocked by that? I know I was growing up in Lutheran. I was like, what do you mean there's more here? All right, now I need that little tongue in cheek, but here's verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So here's the deal, y'all. Jesus says, abide in me, because apart from me, you can do nothing. And we, that's, that's good. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is saying. Hey, when it comes to salvation, you and I do nothing. It's all God's grace through Jesus Christ for you. But Jesus also says, but when you're connected to me and you're abiding in me, you will produce fruit. And Paul says, you were created by God in order to do good works that he already prepared ahead of time for you to do. That sounds a lot like what? I'm abiding in Jesus and he's producing what? Fruit in my life. God says, I already got a plan for your life. I've already got the good works laid out for you to walk into them and to do them. And so this is what the Christian life looks like for you and me. We do nothing without Jesus. We are not saved or forgiven or redeemed without Jesus. It is 100% his work of grace and mercy. And we do nothing without Jesus after that. 
You are not going to become a better Christian without Jesus in your life. You are not going to produce more fruit. You're not going to do more good things. You're not going to change the people's lives that are around you without Jesus. So here's the secret to the Christian life. His name is Jesus. That's it. That's what he's telling us here in his word. Hey, apart from me, you're going to do nothing. But, he says, if you abide in me, if you root your whole life in me, if you build your home in me, I will produce much fruit. I like that. Not just a little bit of fruit, but way too many peppers. Right? Way more fruit than you could ever imagine. And that's a promise he's making to you. It's not a command. It's not a threat. It's a promise of his grace in your life saying, I will produce fruit in your life. I will answer your prayers. I will change people's lives around you if you abide in me. So here's the thing I want you to remember most this week as you go out to live your Christian life. I want you to remember Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that apart from you, we can do nothing. As hard as that is for us to trust and believe at times, we know that it's a reminder of your grace to redeem us and forgive us all 100% by your work. And Lord, may we be people who trust in you each and every day, knowing apart from you, we can do nothing. But if we rest in you, if we live in you and abide in you, you will produce fruit in our lives that will change the world. In your name we pray, amen.